I work at a place called the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. We are in Melbourne. We've been there 14 years. Uh, we now have 45 staff, 900 volunteers. We're a reasonably large organisation. We do a whole lot of different stuff that I'm not going to talk about. We'll skip that because I'm here to talk about our aid programs, in particular our food-related aid programs. Uh, Yasmina has given a, a wonderful, really quite detailed explanation of, of the setting of uh, the global movement of people, and I'm just going to add another little perspective to that. Oh, that's me. That was in, after all the seminar, all the bits I've been to, I was a bit worried I'd forget who I am. By the time I got to present. So, I'm going to talk about, this is a reminder, of what, this is reminding me what I'm going to talk about. Why asylum seekers are hungry, how we at the ASRC fill bellies, our grocery store and our cafe, and then I'm going to talk about the others, and I'm going to deliberately leave that enigmatic so that you're on the edge of your seats and you can't sneak out because you really want to know what that other thing is. Okay, I'll just leave you to read this. Okay, so that's a refugee. So essentially, in layman's terms, what is an asylum seeker? Is that person, where their status as a refugee has not necessarily been recognised. And in the context of Australia, we're talking about people who haven't been uh, given permanent residence. So they believe themselves to be refugees, and they, are, they want that permanent residence in Australia. World numbers, according to, where did I get this from? They're big. So this is just another graph showing a similar thing. We chose Australia down there at, uh, at, at 48, uh, for the, for 48 for the number of um, people living in Australia uh, under these conditions, which is one person seeking asylum per 749 residents, which is not that many. It's something we should be able to handle pretty well without being on the front page of all the newspapers every day. I should hope so anyway. Clickety click. Great. So there's an awful lot to say about asylum seekers in Australia. I want to concentrate on three points. They may or may not have work rights. They may or may not have study rights. They may or may not have income support. Now, if you take all the mays out, and just have the knots, it's a pretty scary scenario. And it's unique in Australia in terms of the, the systemic disadvantage that asylum seekers have therefore exist under. Ah, so we, um, I mentioned that we have a grocery store and I'm going to talk about that in part through the prism of a study that we recently commissioned from the Deakin University Department of Public Health. That's them. Fiona McKay was the lead researcher. And uh, this was paid for by the Paul Newman Foundation. I just add that because it's a little, you know, Paul Newman and the, yeah, him. Um, now, it was pretty thorough. We did an audit of 200 baskets, and by baskets we mean 200 people leaving our grocery store and looked at everything in their baskets and the nutritional value, macro and micronutrients of what it was they were taking home. Yes, we can't guarantee they were eating everything. That's maybe another study, but this is what they were taking home. We also did, I might acknowledge, by the way, Chantel Berzergi, uh, known as Shani, who is actually our food banking coordinator at the ASRC, and she has permission to yell out if I say anything stupid. Uh, 30 plus interviews, or it was for 50 plus or what? 60, 60 interviews, it was a really thorough study. I was in a bit of a rush to get this together because I almost met the deadline last week for the PowerPoints. So some of my data is a little bit screwy. Now, it is worth pausing on this just, just for a moment. This is the asylum seekers who are members of the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre. There are about 1,500 of people in this category at the moment who were in this study, okay? This is not the general characteristics or demography of asylum seekers in Australia. It's a specific group, but let's have, to have a very quick look. 63% uh, male, a lot of people in their 20s and 30s. Mostly coming from the Middle East, Africa, Asia. Visas might be interesting. Some of you, what I'm most interested in, 
There's this bit here. How's the animation, huh? Poor. 58% of the people we looked at had no income, right? So they're not going to the shop. They don't have any money. 6% had income from work. And 35% had income from charity. Asylum seeker payments. Oh, let's get a little bit of perspective here. Average full-time earnings in Australia, currently, weekly earnings, $1,453. It's more than I make. Uh, the poverty, the ACOS poverty line is quite a lot lower than that, which is a little bit terrifying to that comparison. Asylum seeking assistance scheme payments, $229 a week. So we're talking about, what's that? A lot less than the poverty line. And this leads to asylum seekers in this study, 90% of them being food insecure and more than 50% of them being food insecure with hunger. So that's the really bad kind of food insecurity. Joel's book talks quite a lot about how we don't tend to use the word hunger anymore. This is, this is, that, that's hunger. I'm, I'm, we're allowed to use that word, aren't we? Even if we don't. Joel's nodding off there. Thanks for coming anyway. Uh, so our grocery store, this is, this is a lovely snapshot of it. This, um, we actually call one, I'm now going to call it our food bank, because that's what we call it. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather lovely place. We've just moved into a, a new building, three times the size of the old one. We've been able to reinvent ourselves, and um, it's kind of cool. So we have 200 families come to our food bank every week. Approximately 100 of those families are in the no income category. And the average family size is a bit over two. So we're talking about 400 people, and half of them are getting basically all their food from us. So just for a moment, imagine 200 families doing one weekly shop at a supermarket. Imagine That's a lot of food. And um, it's a logistical nightmare. And I'll talk a little bit about how, how we do it. We have three guiding principles. Uh, did anyone notice the misspelling? I was just checking if you were awake. <laughs> yeah, I thought someone was a little smart ass again. Spelled that wrong. Yeah, you're right, I did. Don't say more. We're done with you. Thank you. Prince oh, Prince guiding principles. That's it. Great. Okay. Good nutrition. Good nutrition is about, you can, or we've all got our different definitions of that, but we're basically talking about sufficient, healthy food, meeting your macro and micronutrients of the kind of stuff that you want to eat. Fairness. Now, in this particular arena, fairness at the food bank at the Asylum Seeker Resource Centre means that families with no income get considerably more food than families with income. In some, we, we break things up into different categories of food, and in some of those categories, they get literally twice the allocation. In other areas, it's more like 50% of the allocation, and I'll talk about how that works in a minute. I'm not going to use that word allocation anymore. That sounds terrible. <laughs> Remind me, you know, never say allocation again. We don't allocate food. And this is why we don't allocate food. Uh, because the third principle is dignity. And dignity for us is about maintaining uh, the inventory, bringing the food in, moving all that food while it's the same time, to the best of our ability, imitating a regular grocery store experience. So fundamentally, our goal is you choose what you want. Now we do that within a certain, within boundaries, because we have to make sure, that going back to the fairness thing, so we do have a system, and I'll give you a little, a little example of one part of that system. Um, the, the archetypal old school model that, that I don't think is happening much a anymore is that you know you wait in line and you finally get to the front of the queue and, and the charity says, here's your box of food. Yeah? And it used to be a little bit like that at the ASRC, but I think most of us um, a, a, across Australia and across the world, or the Western world, I don't know, I'm just no. guessing, what are we still, bo still boxes? The vast majority of boxes people in America are free boxes for the yeah. So we won't follow America on social policy. <laughs> just, just in terms of their radical advocates, we'll follow them. Uh, so here's a little example of how that works. So um, one of our sections, which is not a food group, but this section is called Tins and Jars. Oh, wait a sec, because it's hard to read. Although I didn't anticipate the screen being this big. It's enormous, isn't it? 
Tins and jars, yes, it is, it is pretty much tinned vegetables. We have a separate section with vegetable protein, separate section for meat proteins. In this section, if you have income, you get two points per person to spend. If you have no income, you get three points per person. That above that is the two point shelf with the large sort of passata jars. And below that's the one point shelf. So let's say you're a family of four, you have no income, you have four times three, 12 points, and you get to spend them how you want. Okay, so you can take just, you can do, I don't need to explain that, you take what you want. The one thing you can't do is take the points from this section into the next section. And that's how we basically mandate that everyone's leaving with a well-rounded supply of food. And also it helps us to make sure that all the food shelves are stocked for all the visitors. Does that, I explained this to one of my own staff. I was running through this and she's like, what? I don't get that at all. I thought it was really straightforward. So I might just pause for a moment to say, does that make sense to everyone? Maybe she hadn't had her coffee or something. She's a really smart person. I'm like, you why are you getting this? Uh, the sections are, did we put them in, Shani? We changed the thing, didn't we? Food groupings. Yes, here we are. Okay. The fresh fruit and veg section, I might add, doesn't have a system. It's too complicated with points. The whole... Toiletires. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, good. So, the, the fresh fruit and veg section doesn't have a system because we just found it's too difficult to manage what a lettuce is worth for one banana. The whole experience is uh, facilitated and supported by a volunteer. As many of our volunteers as possible are trained. They're nearly all got, they're going through fresh net at the moment with second bite. We also run, run it, Ronnie's not here, but we also run uh, Nest, which is very exciting. So all these organised at, at um, the Oz Harvest cooking program. Uh, but one of our volunteers goes through the grocery store with the asylum seat. So they're making sure that they understand the point system, they may be making dietary recommendations if they're in a skilled position to do so, particularly if a person has diabetes or some other um, issue that means they need particular advice, and making sure that people don't take more than they're, um, more than they're allowed to take. I was going to say allocation. <laughs> uh, oh yes, and that stuff too. So most people leave with a lot of stuff, which is great. Where does the, everybody always asks me, where does the food come from? So I thought I'd anticipate that question. About a third, well, these aren't quite even thirds, but we'll call it a third. Comes from food rescue organisations, Second Bite, Fair Share, Food Bank Victoria and Oz Harvest. We would be absolutely up shit creek without them. We have something called our Food Network, uh, which is a loose affiliation of individuals, families, schools, workplaces, places of worship who donate, uh, sometimes even a, it's a one-off, some of them are weekly, uh, some of them are around particular uh, religious holidays, particular times of the year. That actually does now account for about 50% of the food that we give out. And our budget, we have a budget, that's nice, we actually have money, it's about $80,000 a year. Works out to be about $6 per person per week. We buy bulk foods, volunteers, Spend quite a lot of time taking stuff out of big sacks and putting it in smaller bags. They're all tertiary qualified people and they actually find that really quite therapeutic. Just take a moment just to say hi to people, wave, you know, whilst they take stuff out of big bags. So just to go around there again, because it's a really important slide, they're the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful people uh, on whom we are highly reliant. And the Food Network has a Facebook page. Uh, we've only had it for it's a bit of a new thing, Shawnee's new thing. Two months? Yeah, two, or months. two or three months. We've got 2,780 likes, which is pretty good. We're going to try and work our way up to the ASRC, um, which does pretty well on Facebook. Uh, 130,000 likes, which is apparently the fourth largest of any human rights organisation in the world. That's what the boss says. I haven't quite done the research yet. What's next? I've got no idea. Ah, how we assess nutritional outcomes. So, like most uh, charities, we were very, very busy at the start doing, 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 getting all the resources that we possibly could together, the financial good, the donated good, and distributing that to make it into a social good. It takes an awful lot of time and an awful lot of effort, as I'm sure everyone here knows. 
we've been able to pause a little bit now and do a bit of assessment. So the Deakin study that I mentioned is leading to something we call BERNAS, or Nutrition Assessment Score. It's a brand new thing that we're doing. It's a KPI that we'll calculate annually, basically by replicating the study that we've just had uh, done. It's a food basket audit. We won't necessarily do 20 bas uh, 200 baskets every time. 50 plus is our goal. And a control basket audit. So this is interesting stuff. We're going to send nutritionists through and see what they can do. So we see that we learned both the value of what was there and available versus the value of what was taken. Obviously, we'd like those numbers to be really close, but if they're really divergent, that tells us something too. And that's uh, to be addressed with education, providing foods that people are more interested in, more interviews, finding out why people aren't making the best choices they possibly could in terms of nutrition. And the estimated average requirement across 14 nutrients weighted for importance. So we're treating some of the uh, some of the nutrients as more important than others. And we come out after all of that with a score out of 10. Now our first score for the study that we've just done is 5.9. Uh, I would like it to have been a bit higher, but that's what the data tells us. Which, what that means is basically, on average across those nutrients, again weighted for importance, we're meeting 59% of the EAR. Um, our goal, our stated goal in our strategic plan is to aim for 10% improvement on that year on year. Um, we might even try to do a little bit better than that in the next 12 months. I'm sort of tempted not to mention it because 5.9 doesn't sound very impressive, but um, that's where we're at and we're going to keep working on it. It's a very honest thing, is the, is the thing about it, you know? This tells us what's really there, showing. It was also a Christmas, so one of those days when we had any fruit and veg so, so that, that is important, so for a period of time Christmas um, intervened, but that also led to some of the recommendations from the study, one of which is that we need to do better with our fruits and vegetables being really consistent. Okay, I'm going to race through, that's what we do, isn't that wonderful? So we aim for improvement through focusing on low scoring nutrients and those of greater significance. I'm not going to tell you about Muhammad, poor fellow, he's a lovely bloke, but I haven't got time for him. And we've all talked about this. It's not just what's selected, it's what's taken and what's prepared and what's actually eaten. And that's what the fruit and veg section looks like, which is rather nice. You can see the rest of the ASRC in the background with our 10 foot high portraits of former members. It's kind of cool. Uh, yum. And we have a community meals program, which feeds about 200 people a day, asylum seekers, staff and volunteers. And that makes up part also of people's nutritional landscape across the course of the week. What did I say about it? Oh yeah, that's what I just said. It's about 55 cents per person per meal. I think it's about 90,000 meals a year. Okay. So, what the situation we are in now is about 50% always have enough to eat, and it's the kind of food they want. 30% have enough to eat, but it's not always the kind of food they want and 19.6% reported that they are sometimes hungry. And I've got a whole lot of other stuff to talk about. So the boss said to me when I was reporting on the food bank once, what about the others? And he meant the 9,000 asylum seekers living in Melbourne who are not members of the ASRC. It's kind of been the elephant in the room for us. And we are trying to address that now. We certainly accept in membership of the ASRC those most destitute, but there are a lot of other people that need a lot of help. 9,000 spread across Melbourne, Many without work rights and or income. Ah, living in poverty for years, okay. Housing is food insecure. So, looks a little bit like this. According to the Monash University, some Monash people here, I think, $130 for a single person to eat well in Australia shopping at supermarkets and the like. Average Australian income. New start allowance. So I'm sick of payments. After red. Yes, <laughs> weekly. Yep. Now, even if you could do it at half that price for asylum seekers, uh, we find, and this is anecdotal, that asylum seekers have about $20 per person per week for food, uh, which ain't much. That's less than a dollar per meal. So, insufficient income, knowledge and skills gaps affecting nutrition, insufficient income for public transport, social isolation and alienation. We, next month, hope to launch the Food Justice Truck, which is a bit exciting. It's a heavily discounted mini market operating out of a truck. 
It's staffed by volunteers, nutritionists and dietitians. That is mobile, I, it is a truck. Yeah. And it's a place of community and empowerment. I won't, I'll, I'll move on. Um, so, what we want to do, uh, we've got a first location, we're starting at Footscray Primary School. Every Friday we're going to be there from 3 o'clock till 7 o'clock. We'll attract some of the parents before they go and get their kids, buying fresh fruit and vegetables, press the off button, uh, whole foods and some non-perishables, selling at market rates to the general public and at a 75% discount to asylum seekers. 90% of them are easily identified with their IMI photo ID. 75% discount. So the $20 per person per week that I mentioned will turn into, for people who shop there, $80 worth of food. We're anticipating that this will have an enormous positive effect on the people who shop there. We'll start with one location. We're anticipating the number of something like 40 or 50 general public, 40 or 50 asylum seeker families. By the end of 12 months, we have to be at 10 locations across Melbourne, possibly out of Geelong as well, and getting to 1,000 families. Now, there are a lot, a lot of challenges in that. We've got a bit of um, capital behind us in the form of money through a crowdfunding campaign that raised $150,000. And I've got a little thing unique. I, I'll point this out, and I think it's maybe the last thing that I'll say just about because I'm out of time. Um, what I really like, one thing I really like about the Food Justice Truck is the means of generating the financial good so for the general public to shop there is identical to the means of distributing this as social good. Because the asylum seekers that shop there, we're all shopping together. The only difference is we're paying different amounts of money. We are subverting the dominant paradigm. And I've been wanting to do that for so long. <laughs> um, you can, uh, this is an artist impression, I think is the next one. Uh, we were going to start with a hot meals program. I hope that within a year we'll have that attached to the truck as well, but we won't at the very start. If you want to follow our progress about the food justice truck, you can do so at, at Justice Truck. At ASRC1 is the Twitter feed for the whole organisation. That's me over there. Uh, that's the ASRC. In conclusion, I like to use the term food justice because we have lots of lawyers and we talk about justice all the time. And fundamentally, the reason for food insecure among asylum seekers, insecurity, is a justice issue. It's about do we or do we not value human beings, as far as I'm concerned. So we address this through the Food Bank, the Community Meals Program, which is the Hot Lunch Program, and the Food Justice Truck. It's not perfect. We're working as hard as we can. And thanks for having me. I believe, uh, well... <laughs>